Good evening, members. I'll just get everyone's attention, thank you. <laughs> Members, thank you. The Strategy Planning and Par yeah. Partnerships Committee and the Infrastructure and Public Space Committee public meetings will be streamed live and recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and any or all contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the Council, including transferring about outside of Australia. The Strategy, Planning and Partnerships Committee acknowledges that we're meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the, with the land, we acknowledge they have continued importance to the Ghana people living today. Everyone, welcome to the Strategy Planning and Partnerships Committee, Tuesday, 1st of March. Welcome to those in the, in the public gallery. We have uh, on uh, apologies from Councillor Martin, Councillor Corbell and Councillor Slammer. And I believe everyone else is here. Can <coughs> Members, uh, can I have confirmation, please, of the minutes from the 2nd of February 2016? Councillor Abiad, Lord Mayor, second. Uh, anyone to speak to that? Sorry, what was that? The minutes, confirmation of minutes. I'll put that. All those in favour? Declare that carried. Thank you. Members, we have no public forum. And I have no... Um, Chair's verbal report, except to oh, his councillor Antic, welcome. Um, no verbal report, except from the uh, CEO briefing that we just had regarding motions to the um, the local government association AGM. Uh, we will bring those to this committee in other business uh, for consideration for those motions that uh, we want to pursue. A call for items for adoption on block. Item number seven, proposed community gardens, Adelaide Parklands opposite Bowden. Councillor Clarahan. Uh, item number eight, proposed weather station in the Western Parklands. Yep, I'm putting that Mayor. Item number nine, place pilot reports and place making. Councillor Clarahan. And that's it then. So there are no items for adoption on block. Um, members, uh, Councillor Clarahan, item number seven. Now, members, we do have Andrew Bishop from Renewal SA. Just wanted to just wait for a second, Andrew, thank you. Um, who's in the um, uh, gallery for questions. Uh, Councillor Clarahan, you've pulled this out. Do you want Mr. Bishop to join us if you've got? Any questions? Uh, I didn't really have any questions. I just wanted to make a um, comment about it. Okay. So, Mr. Bishop, stay there, be comfortable, and we'll call you down if we do have any questions. Um, Councillor Clarahan, I'll hand over to you. Happy to move as And I'm happy to move as printed. Thank you. Right, and I've seconded the Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you. Yes, please. Oh, sorry, Councillor Abiant. I'm losing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, look, I 
wanted to report that I represented the Lord Mayor on Saturday um, at the launch of the new play area uh, adjacent to the proposed community garden. And I wanted to say that it was a fantastic event. Uh, I couldn't believe the number of people that had were in attendance uh, at this refurbished or newly created, should I say, uh, play space, which included courts, even had a, a baton pist, uh, it had a children's playground, a, a nature climbing area, uh, and it was just fantastic to see how the community had um, attended and responded to this new space. It was incredibly positive. I took the opportunity to walk over into the, the, the area adjacent to the play spaces uh, where the community garden is proposed and was able to actually discuss this uh, with some people from Renewal SA as well as our own um, administ members of administration. And it's a tiny area that really had no former use apart from um, being a tiny little triangle space tucked away. Uh, and to see it sort of uh, developed as it is now is quite exciting. And it's both close to um, North Adelaide residential area as well as the new Bowden uh, redevelopment. And it's very pleasing to see that when there was a call for expressions of interest, that people from up on the hill, as well as from the newly developed Bowdoin, came together uh, to work to work together on new plans. So I just wanted to add my support to this. Uh, and certainly uh, there's a very interesting group of people uh, who are prepared to roll up their sleeves and, and see how it goes with this community garden. I think it's fantastic that we've crossed over the, the supposed boundaries of our council areas and we're working with both state and the city of Charles Sturt. Um, so I totally support this and they may have some challenges in terms of uh, the initial establishment uh, and given its, um, its location, uh, but I'm sure given the, the people, their level of interest uh, in developing this site, uh, there will be a fantastic response to it and I imagine that the outcome will be of interest to all. The other thing I wanted to say is that it adds to the uh, little hub that's developing in that area of the parklands that we started with the uh, leasing out of the North Adelaide railway station. So there's a lovely little community area developing there uh, and, it, and I'm sure it will be used by people from not just North Adelaide and the city of Charles Sturt, but other people looking um, for another play space and community garden. So I totally support it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Abiad is the second councillor will consider. Uh, yes, my, my um, obviously it's great for creating a little community hub here and who could say no to that and I presume we're being asked for comment on, on, on this but we made comment when the uh, proposal for the, um, the car park and, and basketball fields, which has just been built, came through. And I remember saying we didn't want to see an expanse of black bitumen, and that's exactly what they've built. And um, it's good that the new renewal, renewal SA is here to hear this. Because it's just a, as you drive down the road, you look in, and where you were looking onto parklands, or, or sort of gravelly park, it's now an expanse of black bitumen 18 metres wide. and you look at how Plain Tree Drive was done, where you can see there's two little spurs showing there, where every three car parks, the park comes in and then there's a tree. The trees are close together and grow over and enshroud the, the expanse of car park with trees and shade. But the way this is done, is just there's two little spurs which there are no trees, and then the trees are further apart, so there's open, so all the cars are in the open in the sun, and you just see an expanse of, of bitumen on the parklands and it could so easily have been done by just removing uh, uh, half a dozen car parks and then and it would look so much better. And we said this to the government at the time and, and obviously we ignored and, and it's black bitumen, it's not the sandy coloured long bitumen that again would have looked like the crushed gravel look. Um, so, and then the lights, you know, where uh, Plain Tree Drive has got the Louis Paulson 
um, post top pedestrian lights, which is a nice warm glow and it looks lovely. Here, they're a gooseneck, they're a gooseneck um, highway lighting, which makes it look even more out of touch with things. So, um, you know, I think it's it's a real shame. He's just talking to it. He's allowed to talk to it. I just think it's such a shame that when we provided input on this, it's duly ignored, and the end result could so easily be so much better. And now we've got gooseneck, gooseneck highway lights and an 18 metre wide expanse of bitumen without a lick of shade for the cars. And, and so the uh, question of a really want to say first and, uh, oh, and is is well, um, on, I, I now will invite Mr Bishop to come and well, join us. Respond to how these things came I, I don't think that I think Councillor Wilkins, I think you just made some statements, maybe you've got some a broad range of views. Yes. Any opportunity you've got to a, rectify any of those things. Well you've got a broad range of views there. This is a plan that has been endorsed by council mm -hmm. previously. Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you. Um, but um, welcome, Mr. Bishop. Um, and what I'll what I'll do is rather than uh, I'll just get you to comment on um, the master plan and picking up some of the key elements of the design of the plan. Okay. Thanks. Uh, through the chair, uh, the yeah, as uh, was pointed out, the master plan has come before APLA previously and it's been approved. The um, design was prepared by our landscape architect, Aspect Design. <coughs> the number of car parking spaces was determined on the basis of the demand from the soccer club and other demands in the area. Uh, the number of spaces is marginally higher than it was previously, uh, but only by, I can't be exactly sure of the number, but a handful, uh, less than five. And um, the previous car park that has been <coughs> demolished was, was also a bitumen surface. Um, I take the point that uh, it is fairly straight. It could have perhaps been done in a slightly more synthetic way. At the back of the yeah. Yeah. Thank Thanks. Is there any opportunity to vote? Uh, this is a plan that's been endorsed by Council, Council Wilkinson. And we are just talking about the community garden and this topic. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Mr. Bishop. Thought you were going to comment, Council Wilkinson, on the Mintara slate that's been salvaged. Thought you'd be talking about that. Um, any other speakers? Council Clarehan, Dr. Summer. Thank you. Yes, this is about the community garden. However, I do take Councillor Wilkinson's point um, and with our green agenda, we should be always looking at, um, and especially the location within the parklands, we should always be looking at the way in which we treat those these areas that we develop. I suspect that uh, perhaps an amendment or some other strategy could have been used to pursue Councillor Wilkinson's concerns earlier. It's a bit it's a bit late now, unfortunately. So I think we need to maybe revisit um, our procedures or the way in which we deal with these issues, so that they don't go too far down the track, and then you know we try and fix it after it's too late. Well, I did raise that issue. However, Councillor um, Wilkinson, it needed to come up as a amendment or as a motion um, without, with or without notice, I think. So um, in terms of the community garden, I think this is a fantastic addition and it will service all communities in that pre in that area very well. So I think it's, it's a great initiative and it will have, may have teething problems, but given the number of people involved in their passion, I suspect they'll work very well around those issues. Thank you, Councillor Clarehan, and thank you for the update on the launch from the weekend. Uh, item number eight, uh, Deputy. Oh, sorry. Um, I'll put that, members, all those in favour. All those against. Let's declare that carried. Thank you. Uh, item number eight, Deputy Lord Mayor, proposed weather station in the Western Park. Members, I um, move a, an alternate motion that I circulated to, to members of the Lurie this afternoon. Um, it's exactly the same as the, the uh, published version, except for the paragraph in red. Um, uh, sorry, Neil, if people haven't had a chance to have a read of it yet, it's just adding a, adding a paragraph. So that's good. Seconded by Councillor Wilkinson. 
I was just checking that yours wasn't red and mine was yellow for a second then. <laughs> so let's just give everyone a, just a minute to read it, if that's all right. So members, in my uh, email that I circulated this afternoon, I've said um, really all that I need to say, but for those who haven't received it, uh, when this, this uh, weather station first came to us, we made comment about the fact that we wanted it softened because it was going to be, to take account of the parkland setting, to, um, to make it, or ask the Bureau of Meteorology to do what they could to make it more appropriate for a parkland setting. So I was a bit disappointed when it came back to us with a um, what still looked like a pretty plonked down um, your, um, weather station in the middle of our parklands, in fact um, requiring the removal of some trees. Um, so I've spoken with our administration and there doesn't appear to be a way around it in the sense that um, part of the actual purpose of the weather station and part of it by its very nature it has to be in a, a fairly bare location because it needs to not be interfered with by what's on the ground. But what I'm suggesting here is that um, we asked the Bureau of Meteorology in, in sort of uh, recognition of the fact that we're giving them a parkland location to do it in, to, to put their weather station, and in recognition of the fact that we're charging them over only a peppercorn rent to do that, and fair enough too, because obviously it provides a, a public benefit. Um, you know, they're giving us better weather information, which helps us and helps the city and helps the state. Um, but in recognition of that, that um, they do a bit of landscape work around the area, and so that we get a net gain for the parklands. Um, so that's all um, this uh, amendment seeks to do. It doesn't make the granting of a lease contingent on that. It really is just asking our CEO to, uh, to talk to the Bureau of Meteorology about whether they would be prepared to do that in recognition of our cooperation in, help, in providing them with a site for their weather station. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, I'm assuming the CEO will get back to us with what the response is. Um, Councillor Wilkinson as a seconder. Uh, yes, no, I endorse the Deputy Lord Mayor's um, uh, amendment. I think it's a good idea and reasonable to get something back to the park plans. I, I personally feel that, um, that paying a lot more than $7,300 at Kentown to the weather station facilities there. I know why we proceed to always give away park lands for far less than commercial value, but um, that's not part of the motion. So um, but, uh, at least getting them to contribute to substantially landscaping the routes around the cleared area to create the barren area needed for the weather station and some, some recompense. Uh, any other speakers? Some, would you like some up? Some up. Uh, put that members all those in favour. Clear that carry. Thank you. <coughs> Item number nine, Councillor Clarahan. Yes, um, I'd like to move as printed <coughs> that we note the report. Um, Deputy Lord Mayor seconding. Yep. And I, I wanted to thank administration for this. Um, I think um, there have been some um, considerable learnings from uh, the pilot uh, placemaking um, projects that we had underway. Uh, and in particular, um, that in the, the Hindley Street and the Melbourne Street um, areas. Uh, there were particular challenges initially. Um, for example, the Hindley Street project coincided with the, uh, the work on the road. Um, and in a way that may have facilitated the level of participation because there were so many of the tra local traders and people a bit concerned about uh, the disruption to trade and daily life there. Uh, but I just wanted to say that um, some of the learnings I think we need to take on board in terms of the way we operate as a council generally, and that is, for example, the amount of time that it takes uh, for our administration to work with members in these precincts, uh, and the time it takes in particular to develop trusting relationships. 
I think we tend to underestimate uh, the amount of time that is necessary uh, for our administration to gain the trust of others and um, to work with them until they're prepared to buy in and can see that you know there will be good outcomes for all. Uh, and I think that certainly was something that we saw in both the Melbourne Street and the Hindley Street projects. Of course, the market project that was underway um, had a much broader scope uh, and great successes as well. Um, however, um, I think that um, something we didn't raise last night um, when we were discussing some of our um, infrastructure spend uh, was the importance of the learnings that we took from the placemaking pilots. And in particular, the importance of actually working with, rather than doing to, our community. And I think that extends right across the board, including some of our in infrastructure projects. We talked in particular last night about the importance of adding the, the green, agenda to our infrastructure um, program, but I think we shouldn't lose sight of the learnings of the placemaking work that we've done. After all, we were nat internationally and nationally recognised for our work, and we have learned considerably from that. Um, so I, I do support that, that statement about um, that the uh, placemaking approach should be embedded into the organisation as a cross-functional way of thinking and delivery model, rather than just those specific pilot projects. Uh, and I think I'd be happy to put my hand up, and I'm sure there are others here too, to make sure that indeed when we do undertake our projects that we are working with the community and not just doing to the community and that the empowerment is extended to the community in terms of decision making and input and support of our council projects. <coughs> Any other speakers? Summed up, Councillor Clarahan? Summed up. Members, I'll put that, all those in favour. Thank you very much. Uh, members, we have no out of session papers uh, to receive a note. And as discussed under other business, we're now going to go through um, the five potential motions for consideration to take to the um, Local Government um, Association annual general meeting. Um, Lord Mayor, you have to leave in a minute, is that correct? I've got about 10 minutes. Okay. So we can... Would you like me to... Well, what we've done is actually the administration have prepared them all. So what I'm going to do is um, um, put up a motion to say that we want to present the following motions to the LGA AGM, but then vote on each of them individually in parts. I think that's the best thing to do. So can you put that up there? So can you spread up to the top? Um, just so we just put strategy planning partnerships committee recommends that, that council support the following motions to be submitted at the LGA AGM. And we've got there's five of them. Maybe if we can we just num number them, please. Or a. And then um, so if we could have the uh, I would like to do it now. Move it. So, so Councillor Abbey is moving. I'll have a second, then we'll vote on each one of them, and then we'll remove them if they're depending if they're carried or lost. So, can I have a seconder, Councillor Vershaw? Can we go through them separately, please? We're going to go through them separately, and we're going to vote on them separately. There's six, is it? We'll do that separately. Yeah, yeah. So, um, this is this is stemmed from the discussion we just had in the workshop. Um, I'm going to do this just now. Going to informal. Yeah. Okay. So we'll move into informal, and we'll we'll talk about um, number one. So, Deputy Lord Mayor, you moved, and you've got Council for sure, Councillor. Deputy Sorry, Councillor Abiad, you moved. Seconded by Councillor Shaw, then we'll go to Deputy Lord Mayor. Changing of titles confused me. So we moved. Um, You've actually moved all of them? 
Okay, that's fine. Well, look, I'm happy to reserve. I'm happy to reserve my right at this stage. I don't. Don't need to. Uh, but I don't need to go into a formal. No. Can we discuss them all? Can we have a discussion? I, I want to. Um, I want a debate. But you've had a workshop. We have. We have. Oh, so we have. We have. We have. We have. I just don't. I just don't want you to have to speak once and then not go to speak to another. We're having a workshop before, so we don't have to waste that's right. time. And then that's right. Workshop. Didn't have time to discuss we didn't have enough time, which is why we brought them to committee. Which and they have to go through tonight to make sure that we can submit the motions in time. Uh, so I, I'll be got, I, I think we'll stick to informal because I want you all to have the opportunity to be able to speak on all six of them. And that if we don't go into informal, that will prohibit that. So I'm just going to open up for the first one. This is around um, e-voting. So just to give you a chance to read it. And then I've got... I'm happy to reserve my right at this stage since it's informal. All right, so I've got Councillor Moran and Hinder and Lord Mayor. We don't have this. Um, just look, I, I'm not going to vote for this, um, and the reasons are, um, having not heard the workshop, that um, I don't believe that electronic um, voting occurs in state or federal. You have to go to the poll. Um, I think we should, local government should do as much as it possibly can to get in step with um, federal, uh, federal and uh, state rather than out of step. Um, our elections have proven to be um, not particularly, as we've known in the last by-election and many elections before that, our elections aren't secure, as, as, as secure as they could be, um, and because it's non-compulsory and so forth, I think this will be a very insecure way to, to lodge our votes. If people want to vote, they can answer their envelope or they can come to the town hall and post it. Um, so I just don't think this is nearly secure enough to do yet, and that's why state and federal don't do it. So um, I, I firmly oppose this, and I, I think it'd be a waste of time putting it up in the LGA because they won't support it. I think it's dangerous. When the feds and the state do it, we will copy their software and their their ways of doing it. Why we should strike out a line, an expensive, mm -hmm. easily hacked into, easily corrupted. I mean, our own elections are corrupted. And now, why would you want to enter this mass corrupt statement there? So, um, well, no, our elections have been corrupted many times. It's not pointing the finger at anybody, but we've had, um, I think, 67 votes that were signed by the same person at the last one. In the election before that, we had 700 votes hidden under the stage. Um, so, even in. <laughs> um, so th this this opens. I mean, anybody can hack into anything these days, and um, <coughs> elections are hard fought, aggressively fought, and there are people out there that will um, will do the wrong thing. So I think we stick to what we've got at least till we get that right. We shouldn't go into this. Okay, members, because we've got six of these. I'm just to say that in five minutes. I really don't see. Why I, I'm just trying to expedite the process. Um, for those that weren't at the briefing, can I just ask the CEO to comment on some of the intricacies of this um, consideration for e-voting? Through the Chair, just to, to reiterate, this suggestion is asking the LGA to work with the Local Government Research and Development Scheme and partner with the Electoral Commission and the Federal Electoral Commissioner to adopt a best practice arrangement. So it's not actually saying the LA City Council will do it, it's just simply saying, can they partner? work together, championed by the LGA, to determine a best practice that can be considered. That's all this is asking at this time. So um, I understand the comments you've raised, and, and if we were looking to initiate this as a council, I, I would agree with you that it's probably inappropriate. This is just simply asking the LGA to champion the idea and determine if there is a way forward. Well, just, to count, just on that, the LGA is quite capable of, that's what the LGA is, it's quite capable of coming up with this idea by itself. If we want to um, ask pointy and effective motions and questions at the LGA, we don't come up with little thought bubbles like this. I'm sure <coughs> that across all electoral levels, they're looking at how they can do remote electronic voting. I don't think we need to stick our neck out and um, well, not even stick our neck out, waste our time asking them to do what they're probably already doing. All right, Councillor Moran, it's fine. You've spoken against it. There might be others that want to speak for it. Um, Deputy, Lord Mayor, Deputy Lord Mayor Hender, and I've got the Lord Mayor. I wanted to speak to a, a few of them. Um, we've got a number there that relate to our electoral thing. And my, um, my preference, and I'm interested in other people's views, but my preference is that 
we not do this in a hurry. If we're going to put ideas about um, changing the way we, we uh, the votes are taken or uh, whether they are compulsory or not compulsory, that we give that some real consideration. And as the LGA have these meetings twice a year, and my preference would be to leave anything that relates to electoral issues and to sort of get a common ground position on it first and then take it and, and just do it with some with more consideration that we've got the opportunity to give it at the moment. We've got knowledge. Okay. Lord Mayor. <coughs> Uh, question through to possibly the CEO, uh, Chair. Is, is the inference there that uh, electronic would supplant uh, physical or or both? Would it be one or the other or would it be both? Through the Chair, that would be part of the body of work that would be undertaken. It could be either. Um, it's not suggesting a way, it's just looking at adopted best practice. Um, so that would be determined through the review process. One more question, and uh, what 2020 local government elections? That would be 2018, surely. That was, that's a, we need a variation on that. Uh, I mean, you can extend our term, uh, if you wish, CEO. I mean, we, we, could vote, we could vote for that now, but uh, it's 2018, we, we need a variation. Right, um, okay, just picking up on um, Councillor yeah. Henders' point. Um, we'll just park that one for a minute. Can we just scroll down for those that weren't in the briefing just to have a look at the other? Well, let's not look 2018 either. No, we'll come, we'll come back that's to that. That's like Russian. Councillor Moran, can I just, everyone just has a chance yeah, to read. This and is what informal means, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> 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 But why do right, so the next one is around voting age. The third, the third one is around um, tele staff being able to telework. CEO, do you want to uh, give some definition to that? Through, through the chair, this is this is where we the LGA can encourage the local government sector to have a policy in place which encourages eligible, and the word is eligible, staff to telework. And the percentage of staff teleworking could increase um, over a period of time. The intention for that is that there are cost efficiencies for both uh, the organisations and also for staff and also for the environment by way of people work, being able to work from home under certain circumstances. This is really just leading the charge by way of um, providing that opportunity. Yeah. So it's a work from home um, definition. Uh, Councillor Anty? Yeah, I, I was just going to uh, clarify that, mostly for the benefit of everybody else in the room, uh, not so much for myself, but if we just clarify the, uh, the term telework. Work from home. <laughs> I think I told you. Could we have less? Uh, uh, not rocket science. Um, uh, point four is around the review of the um, code of conduct, which we don't like. Much. Um, and point five is around the uh, the original um, motion that we took to the um, AGM previously on this council's position for um, compulsory voting for this capital city council. Is everyone clear in all five of them? I don't care if you like them or don't like them. Ask the questions now, and we'll just go through. And if you want it, you can choose defer is an option. If you want to send it to a future workshop. Is everyone clear on the five yeah. potential motions? Yeah. What's, what about the last one after that? Yeah, we'll come back to that one. Why that dealt with no, that's been dealt with separately. So I'm just going to go back into formal. At Councillor Antic, are you listening? Um, to you? Yes. Yes. yes, to me. Yes. Uh, going back into formal now, I'm just, um, it's moved and seconded, I'm just going to put it to the vote. No, uh, no, 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 no,
Yes. It's been moved and seconded. Can we speak to it? You can speak to it. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I've given you, you can, or you can defer it. I said you can. So you're back and formal? No, we need it. No, informal, yeah. We are in formal, correct. Yes. And then we can speak formally. That's right. So look, I, I initially, as, as, as the mover of all of them, at this specific motion, I. Councillor Moran, please. I do support this motion. Uh, this is an experimental exercise. This is more of a. Are you ready? <laughs> oh, shut up. Um, this is more of a initiating a discussion to say, look, what are some of the best practices that we can consider in the future that can result in more accessible voting? I mean, ultimately, what we want to do is provide our constituents with more accessible voting in the future. Uh, I'll tell you now, we talk about security. I mean, if banks are prepared for you to tap your phone with someone else and transfer funds, trust me, councillors, people care more about their money than voting. Uh, there is a way to make this secure uh, and very secure. There's a lot of research around this internationally. The lot of systems around the world where they use such systems. Uh, it's, actually, uh, it's actually more succinct um, and it actually delivers results immediately as well. There is no counting process. Everything's quiet. Uh, quite vigilant and there's ways to do it. Uh, so look, it's, it's, this is more of a let's start talking about it. It does always happen, if you look at it also internationally, it always happens at a local government level because it's easy to test and measure. Uh, we've got 22,000 voters in the city of Adelaide. We can account for a lot of people very quickly. Only 7,000 vote, imagine that. So uh, we're not talking about big numbers. So I would imagine even if it was to roll from a state and federal perspective, the council uh, level of voting or local government voting will probably be the testing ground anyway. So this is more of a look. Let's put a, book, uh, a best practice discussion in place. Let's see how we go. Let's start the dialogue. And some of the information that was asked for before by Deputy Lord Mayor Hender will be presented along the way. So this is more, let's have the chat and let's start getting the information through so we can make a decision in the future what it looks like. So this is not let's push the button and make it happen. This is the literal discussion of let's start exploring and getting some options through. So if we can get that through, I think that'll be great. I would ask members to support it. This is a dialogue. Uh, it's not putting anything in action. Um, and let's get some of the research through and see what the local government will be capable, association will be capable of doing uh, with the Electoral Commission to deliver on something unique like this. And why not start with us? Um, if we can start and we can start something in South Australia and have the drive for it, um, I think it will be great. And we can try a best practice process and then roll it out nationally. That's right, we'll develop it itself. That's right. Councillor Moran? Uh, yes, look, I think this is pushing the body to out. Um, it says remote voting at the 2018 local government elections. This isn't just having a little chat, this is getting something in place for our election in 2018. Um, what we should do, and, and um, is I, I totally agree with um, Councillor Hender, uh, that we should defer the electoral um, motions to a workshop. They don't have to go to the next um, local government meeting. They can go to the one after that. There's no rush for this at all. Better to, to rather to go in half cock with half the people not liking it. So I'll defer this one as as I'll defer the others as well to a workshop discussing elections. Do I have a second for that? And the reason I'm doing that is because this has been done very quickly. Now that they're looking on. Obviously, when um, someone thinks it sounds very sensible, you know, we should be having the best practice, da 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 da, da. But we are, at the end of the day, local council. We're not, we're not world leaders in best practice. We, we're doing best practice as we see it in the current form of um, postal voting, which works pretty well. Every one of our ratepayers gets a postal envelope in their letterbox. And hopefully, if they get it out before somebody collects them, they will have a vote. If there's not it there, they can go and ask for another one. But it is totally available. So um, a lot of people don't have mobile phones or computers. So I think to say this would be more accessible for our voters is ridiculous because they've all got letterboxes, they can all get it. Um, but I. <laughs> <laughs> quick, yeah. but, um, so I think we need to have a good chat about this so there is a divergence of thinking. I'm not against the whole thing, obviously this is the way of the future, but I don't think we should put something um, half thought out up to it to probably be lost um, and to get whacked around by the people that are going to say what I'm saying, rightly or wrongly. So I think we need to put a better motion up and discuss it with all the councillors rather than a 10 minute chat before the meeting. 
just checking you're doing one, two, and five. Be deferred to a workshop one, and two, five. That was the comp that's the existing position we have on our members, please. That's the existing position we have. Oh no, I definitely don't on, want that one. I'm totally against compulsory voting. On um, that's the existing. Are you deferring that? Count Samaran. I know. Listen to my question, please. Are you deferring one, two, and five for a workshop? Can I have a look at three? So telework, yeah, yeah. work from home for councillor. Can we change that to work from, we'll work from home? home. Yeah. We'll, we'll yeah. come back to that one in a minute. Councillor Moran, can you answer my question, please? Are you deferring one, two, and five? I certainly am. Right. Councillor Anthony, are you, as a seconder, just clear, clear on that? Uh, I am. Thank you, Chair. All right. Councillor Anthony, as a seconder? No, I think I can reserve my life. Anyone want to speak to the amendment? Council, uh, and council. Just speaking against the amendment, especially on item five, we have an existing position of council. I don't know why this needs to be debated and deferred. We have an existing position cleared twice on council for compulsory voting. This is not something new. This needs to be reintroduced back to the LGA as quickly as possible through an AGM. Uh, I don't support it. I'm happy to support Councillor Moran on item one to say let's have more of a chat about it internally, but definitely not on item five. This is already the position of council, so why are we deferring it? I mean, that's a, a question directed to the CEO. It's, it's a new council. Though, it, no, we've actually voted on this not, again. It's not a question, it's her motion. You yeah, we, we, it. we did vote on she this again also in the new council in December 2000 and when we first got elected. So this was another position we pulled back up again for, for compulsory voting. So 2014. 2014. So this, this is, I have, look, happy to, if you consider removing five and leaving it as an item, I'm happy to support your motion. Otherwise, I will vote it. against it. Just bear in mind that we had a workshop tonight on some of the done, albeit we didn't have enough time, but that's pretty crushed. Yeah. But I just, just, I'm just saying that people should, we need I'm to. happy to take it in part. So you can vote against that. Can I just ask a question on that? I can't recall. Um, if we already have a position that we want compulsory voting, like, what, what are we what are we doing in we we're, we're voting to send this to the So the members no. we're voting to take this to the next AGM, the LGA, which is imminent. So this in the next I don't but know what's We've already got a position on compulsory voting. Why do we have to um see do it? Have members, okay. A deferral for parts one, one. I'm just going to do it in parts. I'm going to do it in parts on parts. Right. To defer one, e-voting. All those in favour? Against? Right, that's deferred to a workshop. Part two on um, 16 years of age. Part to defer. Against, it's carried, deferred, and five on compulsory voting for the capital city local government elections. Defer, all those in favour? No. All those against? That's even, which means it's lost, which is still in the mix then. So we have deferred one and two. Okay, quickly, people moving on. Three, teleworking. Um, anyone want to speak to this one? Could I amend that to work from mm -hmm. home? Or put in brackets. Put in brackets. No, I don't think you can, but. I don't care what it's called. I've never heard of it. And uh, it doesn't. You've already, you've already, no, you can't. It's uniform, you've already spoken. So um, I'm just going to put it to take this to the current um, LGA AGM. All those in favour? Again, oh, sorry, I'd like an opportunity to speak to that. Well, I asked you to speak to it. Well, I have a hand up. Oh, my apologies, so, <laughs> Councillor Hender, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, I won't support it. I might be able to be convinced about it. So, my understanding is that there are a number of organisations who have had this sort of arrangement who are now bringing people back into workplaces, um, for example, Google or one of those organisations, Google or it's one of the other big ones, Yahoo, um, who have is it Yahoo? Yeah, who have um, said to their their um, employees who were working remotely that they want them back in the office because they find that uh, their their internal research has shown that creativity 
and inter, you know, come through that interpersonal interaction. So I might be able to support it if I knew a bit more about it, but just from my anecdotal, you know, the anecdotal stuff, um, that uh, too many people out of the office um, so may well actually be hostile yeah, to an organisation. I'm not convinced, really. Do you want to defer to the workshop? Happy to defer to the workshop. I'm happy to defer to the workshop. I've got a second amendment, and this is the second amendment on this um, item. Who seconded in that? Which I did. Councillor Farahan. <laughs> Can I can I put the amendment or you want to talk to it? Councillor Wilkinson. Um, as a small employer, three or four staff, um, I find a limited amount of flexibility to now enable staff to work from home is is actually can be positive, particularly if you've got sort of staff who are mothers and and, uh, and have other dealings. So for as someone in small business as myself, where you can't always afford to pay people at lots of to stay there, you can you can give employees uh, uh, sort of a, a work satisfaction through through flexibility, and this is one way. It's quite a different thing for someone to be working from home five days a week and then never in the office, or only coming once a week. I actually think it adds to the camaraderie of the office to have people generally in the office to have some flexibility to enable to do it. On an occasional or, or you know one afternoon a week type scenario, I think is um, is, is, is workable. So I'm, I'm open to considering it in limited applications. Okay, thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Any, anyone want to speak against this deferral? Um, Councillor Hendy, I'm signed up on the amendment. Um, I'll put the amendment to defer this item. Um, to the workshop, all those in favour? Yeah. Against, that's carried. Uh, members, um, so just to, the amendments currently stand as one, two, and three to be deferred. Um, item four to talk, call on a review of the local government code of conduct. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah, put, so can I vote on that one? Oh, no, sorry. We're going to vote on everything together because uh, that one's going through. And number five on the capital city local government elections. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. Old. So I'm going to just put that. I'm going to tell you what exactly what you're voting for: to defer one, two, and three to a workshop for more discussion, and to take four and five to the AGM. Clear? Yeah. Debbie, uh, Councillor Abia, can you like to sum up? I'm done. Members, I put that. All those in favour? Okay, that carried. We got there in the end. Uh, now we do have um, a, an item of um, other business, um, but I'm just going to quickly adjourn this. Oh, we've got that one too. Uh, we've got two items of other business. I'm just going to quickly adjourn this meeting as we need to open the other meeting. Can I get a mover? Councillor Shaw, Councillor Antic second. All those in favour? So that carried. Okay. I declare the Infrastructure and Public Space Committee open and call from the chairman. Deputy Lord Mayor Pender, seconded by Councillor Clarehan, in favour of the The chairman passed. I now adjourn the meeting and turn back to the planning committee. Thank you. For those in the gallery, we, have, we, we just had a procedural. Um, to, to procedure to follow where we have to open committee meetings by a certain time. Um, I now reopen the Strategy Planning and Partnerships Committee um, and now um, ask you to consider the motion for the um, Australian Local Government Association Annual General Assembly, um, which is for consideration upon um, the Australian Government to provide relief from the GST on materials and labour used for all listed Heritage Conservation Projects. Moved by Deputy Lord Mayor Hender, second to Councillor Wilkinson. I just think it sounds like a splendid idea. Good day. Councillor Wilkinson agrees. <laughs> Anyone else want to speak to it? Yeah, just one question. Um, the, uh, we have a situation where we have a lot of historic buildings that are not listed, where we have mechanisms where uh, people can sign a land management agreement 
to um, to get funding assistance to restore their building. So part of this is about providing an inducement for people to retain and restore the buildings rather than leave them to rot or to take the option of demolishing them. Was, I sent you that information about the employment multiplier effect of employment, that's why this is a national significance. So if this could be, um, someone was happy to move an amendment or move as happy to move an amendment but, um, that enabled it to be extended to um, uh, the ability to incorporate new new listings. Can, can I make a suggestion, Council, and I'll take some advice here that this is just a motion going to the annual general assembly. It's yeah. by not means detailed. It's about the concept of having um, this. This can be considered, and I think that the detail as to what it would cover would come later. Am I correct? So we're not talking any detail as yet. We're just putting the proposition or the concept for, for consideration. Just maybe if the word listed was taken out, so I just said heritage conservation projects, there might be a slightly broader um, thing that could encapsulate picking up, because we've got many, many buildings in the city of Adelaide and outside the uh, in, in suburban councils in South Australia, there are many, many buildings uh, that are not listed and creating this tax um, tax break to, which has worked overseas in America very effectively and has precipitated works happening, which has actually generated employment and stuff like that. But it's on buildings that are not currently listed where the most opportunity for this to have good effect is. So, so I'll take some advice because my, 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 well, I just think if you take out the word listed, yeah. you lose the you punch right. in, the, in the sentence. And you also do need to have some criteria that to, to, for, for consideration, not to say that the criteria, the detail will be considered when, when, the, when the actual um, legislative decision is made. So I just want to take some advice. More eligible. I, I think, I, I think you might lose the, the the impact of what you're actually claiming, even what you're saying if you take out the word listed. Yeah. Uh, I threw the chair on. Um, like just uh, my observation would be that um, including the word "all" might be a little bit too broad in terms of what the um, how the Australian government might respond to that. And um, similarly, the, the word "listed." Um, my suggestion would be that if you um, used a word along the lines of "approved projects," that would um, indicate to the Australian government that. You expect them to meet criteria for approved heritage conservation projects. That could enable it to be extended to new listings. Well, hang on, let's just, uh, before we do that, um, it's been moved by uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, seconded by you, Council Wilkinson. I'm just going to take it back to you as the mover. No, the mover's saying no. Um, so we're, so can I just leaving? say, I, I'm, I don't want to take out the word listed, but I understand Council Wilkinson's intent. This is just going to Council. I wonder whether it um, if Councillor Wilkinson had some other words we might add in to, to capture it properly at Council, we could yeah. tidy it up a bit at Council, but we, we've, got, we've all got the intent, yeah. I think. So mm -hmm. for me it's listed and really what you're saying, and listable, but I know that's not actually a word. <laughs> so we need the words that say that. Yeah. yeah, I think we need to be careful with the words that we use in, for a motion. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Clarence? Uh, look, I think the wording as it was originally is the best wording. You know, there's this thing about shooting yourself because, yeah. because you wanted everything or too much, you shoot yourself in the foot and get nothing. And I think that we need to be very clear and say all listed, listed projects, heritage um, conservation projects, and that would to me would be an incentive for those people who are not listed to actually get listed which is what we really want. Um, if we take away the listed, it's just open slather, it's too hard to manage, we may end up with absolutely no support whatsoever. So I would stick with the original wording that we had um, in order to get something. This is going to be taken to the National General Assembly, not the South Australian Local Government Association, because it's a, a federal thing. We're looking to the federal government, for example, well, we are, um, to look at that as an incentive scheme or 
a concession scheme. And so um, we need to be very careful with our wording because it is going to be under national scrutiny. That's a good point. Um, for no more speakers, I'll just get you to turn your mics off. Um, Deputy Lord Mayor, did you move this one? Summed up. Put that all those in favour to call that carried. Uh, we now have um, a motion without notice from Councillor Shaw. And do you want to, um, have you distributed? Yes, you did. To everyone? Can you just read it out? Councillor Curran, can you turn off your mic, please? Could you just read it out? Thank you. That uh, the Economic and Community Development Committee requests that the CEO call a workshop to discuss Council's international relations strategy in the light of the draft Adelaide City Council Strategic Plan 2016 to 2020 to consider Council's overall approach, key destinations of focus, and the appropriate mechanisms to further these relations during 2016 to 2020. So I've got a second in the deputy Lord Mayor, just um, making sure you've got the right committee So strategy planning and partnerships. Deputy Lord Mayor Hender has seconded it. Um, you have the floor, <laughs> Councillor Shaw. Thank you. Um, I'm sure a number of other councillors have been approached by various groups uh, about the potential for the council to enter into either formal or informal relationships um, with cities through either the sister city relationships or other informal arrangements as some of these already uh, connections are in place. Um, and I think we have the opportunity now that we've got strategic plan to have a look at it and put have a workshop where we consider all of the options available to us and, um, and have a look uh, at where we focus in the coming years uh, so that we can make best use of these connections and partnerships. You were, you were quick off the mark, Deputy Lord Mayor Hinder. Yeah, look, I think this is a great initiative and uh, my only, um, uh, the only thing I've got to add is that uh, I really like the, um, uh, the workshop to happen relatively quickly because I think there are some pressing um, what would you put the bids almost uh, that we need to be able to get back to people and say yes, no, or, you know, how, or opportunities, opportunities, is perhaps a better way. Councillor Abia, anyone else? <coughs> Councillor Bashaw would like to sum up. Members have put that, all those in favour, there that's carried. Any other business members? I'll then close the meeting. Thank you very much.
Uh, members, I declare the uh, Infrastructure and Public Space Committee open at 6.39. The Infrastructure and Public Space Committee acknowledges that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays, pays respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living here today. Apologies and leave of absence. On the Councillor Martin, do you have any other apologies? Um, yeah, Councillor Corbell and Corbell. And Councillor Corbell, the Lord Mayor. And the Lord Mayor. And Councillor Slammer. Confirmation of minutes to have a mover. Councillor Clarahan, seconder. Councillor Vershaw, I put that. Those in favour, those against. Carry, thank you. Public forum. We have no nil items in the public forum. Um, Chair's verbal report. Um, when we get to item eight on the agenda, I will be requesting to speak to that item about the Queen Adelaide room. Um, if that comes up at item eight. Um, items for adoption on block. Um, and the first, uh, the workshop on hard waste, um, we will be deferring that item. The reason why we're having an item came about is because Councillor Martin had actually called for this workshop and he is overseas at the moment, so it seems when he's having a workshop with the very council that moved the workshop we had is not here. So we won't be having that workshop. Um, item eight, Queen Adelaide Room refurbishment. For call out. Councillor Moran. Um, Item 9, Wanapanga Incorporation of Port Cultural Hub 5 within Nursery. Yes, yes. Councillor Sorry. Hinder. Deputy Lord Mayor Hinder, apologies. Yes. Item 10, Declare Public the Unnamed Private Road West of Clarendon Street. Uh, item 11, Colonel Light Centre, Green Wall and Plaza. Yes. Councillor Antic. <laughs> Okay, so oh, oh, ten. no ten. So the only one that's not been uh, called out is item uh, ten. So I need a mover for the for that. Which item ten to be put on block? Deputy Lord Mayor Hinder, seconded by Councillor Antic. I put that. Or oh, any discussion? I put that. All those in favour? All those opposed? It's carried. <laughs> that brings us back to the first item called out, which is item 8, Queen Adelaide Room, referred to Councillor Moran. 
Uh, yes, I'd like to move option one. I'll, I'll second it to hear uh, what Councillor Moran has to say. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Councillor Moran. Yes, well, I think um, it's a very simple argument. Uh, option one is um, Edmund Wright's um, actual design, the fact that it wasn't built and it was an attenuated form. Um, was uh, the room was decorated in not his, it didn't actually get around to doing. It doesn't take away from the fact that that's what he intended the room to be decorated as. And option two, rather peculiarly says, it is proposed to interpret architect Edmunds Wright's original intention to treat the space by divided laws. Why would you interpret the original when you have the original? Surely that is the whole point of, of uh, restoring buildings to their original, is if we've got the original, do the original. Um, we don't give, um, in our heritage incentive fund, we're very strict. Um, if there is an original design or original example of that house, that is what must be done. We don't accept interpretations of the original heritage of the building. If it exists, so if a neighbouring building has it, or there are plans that show what the, the building should should have been like, they are what we insist on being done. And yet in this case, we are going for an interpretation. And I would suggest possibly because it's a cheap, cheaper way of doing it. But when you do the, do a room of this um, importance to the civic life of Adelaide, and to the history of Adelaide, I think it's really incumbent on us to, um, to spend the money and do it properly even if we have to stage it. I'm not an expert in interior decoration, but um, it seems a bit of a no-brainer, this one, that you know you have the original design. The excuse not to do it is because it never was done. Um, and then instead, you're going to get an interpretation of it. Well, why? This seems completely counterintuitive. Um, so, Councillor Clare, has it said? Is that right? Can anyone else like to speak in this matter? Yes, Milani. Can I get a question? Uh, start a question for now, please. Yes. Um, did you say Miss Milani? Um, just, I'd like to just get an interpretation of the recommendation on page thirty-three, just to get some clarity, please, Chair, from the person that wrote it, which I'm assuming is down this end of the table. Do we have Yes. Introductions. Yes. This is Andrew Clankey from the Swan Move Henglades. He was the person who actually originally discovered the original plan by um, uh, Edmund Wright. Edmund Wright. And brought it to our well, attention. Got a question so, and some clarity, Chair. Yeah. Please. So, heart pain. I'll, I'll repeat my question. Just on page 33 um, of our report, which is page. 23, I think, of mm. your report. No. I'm correct. Yes. 33 of ours, 23 yeah. of the original report. Just, just where the recommendation is made, I'm just curious to get some inside information on that. Well, thank you for the question, Councillor. Um, this it has been a very interesting exercise. Um, uh, uh, much of our time was spent in actually researching the history of this space. It's a very interesting space uh, historically and quite an important one for the town hall. Um, basically, it was originally intended to be used as a stock exchange. Um, that was the intention of its original design. The lower ground floor of the town hall was originally intended to take the telegraph office, the Adelaide telegraph office, and uh, the telegraph at that time would not relocate to the building. This was part of an exercise to pay for the cost of the building um, to get tenants into the building. And um, the, um, the telegraph office wouldn't act, the biggest users of the telegraph was the stock exchange. So they the telegraph office wouldn't actually move to the building unless there was a stock exchange provided for. So that's the reason why that room was actually provided in the original plan for the building. Um, now, in actual fact, what happened was the government re reneged on the original agreement and the telegraph office actually never moved here. So council um, subsequently tried to find other uses for it and it basically became 
was always known early on as the exchange room, even though early on it was used for a number of other purposes. It was used for public meetings, it was the polling place for the council and for the state-based um, government seats. Uh, it was used for lectures, um, a number of organisations met there, the Cricket Association, the SACA used to meet there, uh, the Chamber of Manufacturers used to meet there. It was the place where the celebration was held, uh, where um, uh, the completion of the Overland Telegraph line was actually held in that space. But it was also used for a whole bunch of other performances also. Um, uh, in 1916, the council made a decision to actually dedicate that space to reception purposes. So previously it was a rented space that you could actually hire and use. Um, in 1916 it became an official reception space, a civic space basically for the council. Uh, and from that time on, basically it was the 14th of, it opened on the 14th of July, 1916. So it's almost a hundred years it's been used for that purpose. Um, the recommendation that we've, came, we've um, made in that instance was mainly because uh, option one um, didn't actually ever actually happen, didn't, was never constructed. It was removed uh, as a cost saving measure uh, early in the um, uh, construction phase of the building to get the price down uh, sufficiently. And when um, more money was eventually voted to complete the building, that uh, work did, wasn't actually carried on. In fact, Wright didn't actually, um, it could have been implemented subsequently, but um, Wright didn't seem to have, you know, um, the, the, the money was there to do the work, but it did, never actually occurred. So um, I suppose if anything, it demonstrates the priority that he had for that space. And I think he was probably more concerned with the auditorium and you know, more significant spaces such as that. Our view is that, in actual fact, the reception use of the Queen Adelaide Room, um, from what we can determine, it was very simply treated historically in, when, at that time when it was in the exchange, called the exchange room. Uh, the first good descriptions we have of that, of the decorative treatment of that um, space, is actually from 1916, when it was first seriously considered as a major reception space and it was decorated accordingly. Um, on that basis, we've um, looked at that as the period you know, to look at. There, there's lots of details that we still don't know, but we know it was papered, we know it was papered in panels, we know what the frieze was like, we know the sort of colour scheme that was used, we know that what the carpet was like. So on that basis, we've used that as a basis to come up with the decorative treatment for that room. But in doing so, we've also, because we knew that the space was divided up into panels, we've used the information on Wright's original intent to um, develop a scheme that also references that. But the main emphasis here is really about the 1916 treatment of the space. Um, certainly, option one also creates a few problems with the current use of the space. It is used at the moment to also display um, the civic collection and there are a lot of restrictions that option one creates because of implementing the curved corners and the likes. Uh, so that was one of the reasons also for not um, uh, looking at recommending option one. Does that answer your question? Uh, just a subsequent question on that point because option one was, um, you, you referred to the um, uh, the original purpose of which it wasn't, which is the, you talked about the telegraph. Um, yes. When you talk about the the um, the curve, which you're, you're talking about, is that, is that you had to change the actual alignment? Is that what you're saying? Of, that's what option one would do. Uh, correct. Well, basically, in the corners, um, I'm not sure within the presentation of there are some images of the options. Mm -hmm. If you scan oh, through. You yeah. If we scroll yeah. through, that will help. Yeah. Yes. Oh, well, if you want to keep going, that's based on the drawings, um, the original drawing. This is it, you know, the way it was displayed uh, you know, as the Queen Adelaide Room. In, in 1953, it became known as the Queen Adelaide Room after um, Queen Elizabeth II 
uh, permanently loan portrait of Queen Adelaide. So we keep going. So the option one, and then if you go to the next slide, this. So these are we've actually shown the um, way that we look. So that, is that curved? Is it? Is that yes, the, 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 the corners are actually corner. curved. That's correct. So um, and this is based on that drawing of rights. There has some modification been required, so the proportions have been changed because the ceiling height's actually lower now than what it was at the time when it was actually constructed, mainly for acoustic reasons for the auditorium above. So um, if you go to the next slide, this gives you a look in the other direction. So, and um, so that's that's option one. If I if I can ask you to continue and go to the next one, this is option two. So as you can see, it's quite different in terms of its appearance. Um, as I said, the decorative treatment is very much based upon um, the information that we've had um, based on the decorative scheme that was implemented in 1916, and there's descriptions of the colours that were actually used at that time. So this is. Um, that's been introduced in this instance that also uh, the difficulty that we have with the with the 1916 scheme is that the space was actually not one full um, area it was actually subdivided so there were smaller rooms actually located within that area also um, and surprisingly there are very few photographs of the actual interior of that space from that early period there's, there's, we haven't been able to find one photograph of it when it was known as the exchange room and there are no photographs of it until about, other than very grainy images from newspapers, until about um, 1940 or so. So, yes, sorry. Um, my question to administration then is, um, have we, I can't, we haven't actually costed either of these. Do we know the difference? Yes, yes. Oh, no, no. Sorry, so 11, 11 all in is 24.1 channel 5. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That must be enough. Okay. So, under 11. Do we have any other speakers? Thank you, uh, Andrew. Do we have any other speakers before I ask to speak from the chair? Deputy Lord Mayor Tender. Again, just a question at this stage. Um, the, um, the lighting in all of the options seems to me to be. Sorry slightly incongruous, not the chandelier bits, but the spot bits. And I'm wondering why they've been recommended like that and whether there's no option that hides that sort of lighting back up into the ceiling. Um, it really does seem to me to be... I'm sure Edmund Wright didn't design those. <laughs> I'll worry about that, I have to say. I, I do understand the comment and um, I can say we've been considerable time looking at it. The problem we have at the moment is the ceiling is actually an acoustic ceiling. So basically any penetration we put in there creates uh, an issue with the, because the auditorium is directly above. So um, it creates some significant problems if we start cutting holes in the ceiling. Um, so based on that, we did look at several options. One was mounting things on the ceiling, but in actual fact, in our view, uh, we think that's more obtrusive than actually suspending them, which is what we're proposing to do at the moment. The problem is, as you're uh, presumably you're aware, the lighting levels in that room aren't particularly good. It's a, it's a difficult space to, especially trying to highlight um, issues associated with the city collection. So um, these proposals are actually to also look at those two strips as to have an LED strip continuous strip on the top of those tracks. So there's different lighting modes that you'd be able to create and that would actually allow for up lighting of the ceiling um, to uh, in, you know, supplement what's actually happening with the chandeliers um, as well as spotlights. The, the problem with spotlighting is that um, when you're trying to display things um, as a gallery type space you do need some controls over the spotlight, so therefore that's the reason why the size that they are, but I can show you that it's small so we're able to, um, to have that function. Um, the, the only other alternative is to try to do something in the side walls and that then creates problems because you start casting shadows because you're trying to throw across a room. 
so it becomes something of a problem. So on that basis, that's the reason why we've selected the track lighting. I do admit the track lighting is more visible on this one. Um, if you have a look at option two and option three, I, don't, I think it's less visible, mainly because, probably because of the colouring of the space generally. Um, Can I just ask a follow-up question? Yes, I don't understand why lowering it down and dangling it where it's more visible, why why you consider that to be less intrusive than putting it on a ceiling where, I understand about not being able to get it flush, but at least, well, I just, I don't understand, if you could just explain that. Um, well, uh, within these models, we actually did put it on the ceiling to look at it, and by putting it, tending to mount it directly on the ceiling, it's, it actually make, tends to make it more visible. Mm -hmm. By dropping it down, it tends to fit in with the lines you know, associated with the corners and the like. If you mount it on the ceiling, it's quite clearly on the ceiling. Uh, it tends to be... Um, it, yeah, it's very it's, intrusive. Very Could I ask you a question? What does the art gallery do for lighting and artworks? They, in, they, in, for example, the Elder Wing, you know, this mm, sort of heritage. They, they have a different configuration because they've basically got skylights over uh, the top. Yeah. All of their track mounted lighting is actually above the skylights, oh, so you okay. don't actually see it you in space. It. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I don't have an issue with that suspended lighting. So I, I think our, our, our view was lighting. to, it's very, it's virtually impossible to conceal, yeah. so we'd be better off actually you know, making it visible, I suppose. So. Are there any other comments um, or questions? There were just some, um, ask, it's very hard to see from, from this report, the carpet. Do you, did you want to, have you got some slides? Yes, there's some slides that? if you continue on, please. It's there's all sorts of things in here, but anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <clears throat> If you go to the next slide, the slide is actually the design for the carpet in the room. We've actually got a sample of it here, a hand trial. I'm not sure where we're going to it's all going to be one of our master fans, not the biggest big fans. I'm not sure how to do this, but it's better to actually do it on the drawing board. We yeah. probably can just do that. Who's crawling under? Come on. Oh, oh, poor Andrew. Oh, <laughs> quite align but um, the reason why there's two here there's two different colorways but this gives an idea of more of the border <laughs> what we ask well, um, ourselves <laughs> Thank you, Andrew, and I'm on behalf of the council, we apologise that she had to resort to no, 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 the no, no, no. uh, right Excuse me. I just, just wonder where, speaking formally, we should um, defer this to a workshop because, I mean, it, we're now informed and we're looking at carpets mm -hmm. and things. I mean, we and the pictures of what option one, option two look like are not that good. Mm -hmm. I, I'm happy to withdraw my motion to option one and move to referral. So we can, we can spend time with it. Otherwise, I'm just going to ask the cup to be packed up and move on to the time issue. No, there's not. Yes, there is. Well, we're going to ask what it is. Is the carpet the same in both? I can't tell. No, I do admit it's very hard. Unfortunately, the screenshots, as you can see, don't really reflect based on the hand trials. They give an indication. But basically the carpet design was based on the 1916 design for the carpet, which is, um, which was a, a, a sort of a, um, uh, a repeating floral pattern. And we know the colourway, it was um, a black, natty blue and, and pink. So we've used that as a basis to come up with this current design. Thank, thank you for that, Andrew. Um, members, if I could um, uh, 
the, uh, the CO has advised me that there is implications of timing if this um, uh, being done this financial year, uh, if, it, if it is deferred, or both. It's been like this for many years anyway, so it's probably not the end of the world. But um, some some details like the carbon selections and, and wall finishes and things like that could be ascertained subsequently if once we're able to provide some direction um, in terms of the, the general approach. If I could ask you to speak. Well, can I ask you a question on that, on what you just said then? Because we have a master plan and we and we're rolling that out now, and we, you know you're talking about different eras. There's, there's two different eras between option one and option two. I mean, surely we're going for some consistency throughout the whole civic areas of the town hall. What's Perhaps if that could segue into what I'd like to say. Well, I thought that's a genuine question. Put that to the side. Is that a carpet question? It's the whole thing. What's the consistency? Well, I think that's something we need to talk about. That's option two. Sorry, what was the question? Consistency. Um, can I go back to the previous slide, please? So, this is actually a flood fill of the uh, civic areas in terms of its design development. It's not totally resolved yet. We feel as though the Queen Adelaide room, depending on which option is selected, is is uh, essentially um, resolved. But um, if I can just ask, what we have done is actually looked at the design of all these spaces and how they interrelate. And if I can ask to, to progress a couple of so, slides. So option one could have this carpet too? Yes. Uh, it is possible, but I do personally think there's some confusion if we introduce this carpet because it is really so this based is what I mean this is what I want to defer because basically we've got a report recommending something we've allowed the writer of the report to speak for nearly half an hour cutting my motion off pretty much at the knees um, I would like us to pull back and get information so I can we can properly look at option one because this is <coughs> totally pushing option two which you know is a fine option but I think we really need to convince ourselves that option one which is the design of the buildings option um, is is to be rejected before we get uh, stampeded with color carpets and um, low and I'd rather see uh, would like to speak please so Richard, there, is, there is no issue at all with deferral um, it will just mean this project won't be completed this financial year. As long as you're you're accepting of that, there is no problem. Um, nice by by deferral, it will allow us to go away and do some further work regarding the options and the, the associated carpet that would go with those options, and we can come back to you at a workshop. So it's quite okay. Could, could I just ask one Deputy one? Lord Mayor Hender, and then I would like to speak before we close up this one. Um, in in deferral, one of the things that I would be really interested in. So it was an issue that um, uh, Councillor Moran raised. The issue of what would we expect of another owner if this wasn't ours. Um, so I'd, I'd be really interested in our administration's advice on that. Um, would we expect another owner to go back to the original design, uh, despite the fact it was never built or probably ever intended to be built? Or would we be happy with the builder, with the owner to go back to what? Um, what, you know, what happened in the design um, of when it was first established the design, yeah. as a civic reception? Yeah. As a civic room. So, I mean, I do think uh, so it's for me the point is we, um, we're custodians of this building and we should be doing, we should be setting ourselves to the highest standard. I'd be interested to know what we would ask if it was somebody else's building. Um, so, Deputy Lord Mayor, would you like to be moving a deferral? Oh, um, whose idea was that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm happy to, to uh, move for a deferral if, that, if everyone's content with that. And I don't see why it has to take that long. I mean, we just need to see all the information, not we just the deferral motion from the Deputy Lord Mayor. Councillor Antic, would you like to speak to that? No. Second, would you like to speak to that? Yeah. Yeah. Could I ask? No. If this yeah. gets up, can we just also, I'm interested in 
if we're picking one era over another era for the Queen Adelaide room, what era are we picking for every other civic room? We've, yeah. There's got to be some consistency. I don't, I don't understand. You can't just pick one era. I mean, the Lord Mayor's room sort of early Moran leather, and then this room sort of. Uh, well, that's my point. I think that is my point. We need some consistency. Um, if I may speak before we. I, I, would, I would appreciate the opportunity to speak on this issue because the consultants had a lot of opportunity to speak and I haven't yet. Um, the um, the, uh, the uh, this building is an 1860s building. The auditorium was built to to. Um, uh, Edwin Wright's design, the um, uh, the room behind the stage um, was built behind to his design. Um, the uh, uh, we have the benefit of his original design, and um, uh, the uh, opportunities there to do it, you know, per the original design, doing it once properly rather than choosing. You know, plucking a sort of a 1916 um, thing and going to that, and um, the uh, the curved corners is based on the uh, you see that in Palladian architecture in in, um, uh, in Italy, uh, Antonio Palladio, and then that's based on that sort of thing. We have that um, in the auditorium and, and the. Um, uh, uh, the room behind the, uh, the stage, the, um, and the mental blank there. Um, but we've got the benefit of that, and um, uh, I don't see um, that um, the uh, the issues of the curved corners and things like that. That's actually an opportunity. You can see from the 3D visuals that looks far more impressive. And um, and I just being involved in the construction industry, I don't think that. Uh, the difference in cost between option one and option two is necessarily going to be of the magnitude that's been being expressed. The, the, the curved corners were lath and plaster; they were lightweight. They weren't. They weren't brick. You know, that's how they originally were, were designed to be built. Um, the original design had a bulkhead around the perimeter that would provide some opportunity for um, lighting opportunities. Um, using that bulkhead in my professional opinion without having to necessarily resort to track lighting as 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 those visual we saw. I think there's nicer ways of doing that. And and the displaying of the um, of the uh, the work shouldn't really be a priority over the overall look of the room because the principal function of this room is for our civic reception. So it needs to look as grand, as impressive and true to the original as, as possible. Its purpose as a um, sort of an art museum thing is, is a secondary to its primary function, and, and I think there's opportunity to uh, to uh, achieve um, a, a subtler outcome utilising the original design. And I think you know this carpet, which can ties in with the um, with the uh, with the rest of the uh, uh, town hall, could easily be incorporated into either either option. So it would seem crazy not to go use the original uh, Edmund Wright design as we have the benefit of it. And in Sydney, um, when uh, the uh, Woodson's design for the interior of the Sydney Opera House wasn't was budgeted out of the original construction, they then got the original designs uh, quite recently and then completed it to the original design. Um, and, um, and the 1916, as was said by the consultant, <coughs> it wasn't actually as one space. In 1916. Yeah, so, um, so uh, I'll hand back to uh, the Deputy Lord Mayor. To... Uh, no, I'd like to speak, please. Oh, Councillor Clarence. Yeah. Look, I'm, I'm happy to support the deferral. Um, I just wanted to comment that I'm really disappointed and saddened in a way that we get this far down the track where all this work's been put into it and then we suddenly find that there's a major philosophical difference in terms of the approach. I mean, we need to acknowledge that there have been other heritage architects, including our own on council, who've been involved in this whole process. 
So I think we need to revisit how we do these things because we have indeed, I think, wasted a lot of time and energy and good intent uh, getting this far and then having to go back. I do support the deferral because I do think that we do need to make sure we are making the right decision. But I reckon we should have been discussing this some time back previously because um, it has a lot of water's gone under the bridge in terms of hard work and you know consultation with various people and etc. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge the work of Andrew and our own team. Um, they have worked very hard on this. They yes, they are looking at how this whole thing emerges as an interrelated continuous theme across all our civic rooms. Um, and you know, I do want to acknowledge the work that's gone into that and thank you very much to our staff and to Andrew. And I hope you know that I may not be here for the workshop we have if it's going to happen soon, but I understand that you know it is about philosophical approaches, differences in approaches to these these sorts of things. Okay. I, I'm not going to support the deferral because I we have had a consideration on this. This is the third time I think it's been. We've got someone in to do the master plan. They've made a recommendation and I'm really open to, to their expert view on that. They've worked with our team on it. And um, I, I personally feel that um, option two is perfectly, it's the recommendation, it's part of the master plan. I've got to have a bit of, I'm no expert in eras and carpets, and but I do feel that that's what the experts are saying. That's what they've been saying for a while now, and that is the master plan that we're working towards. So, what are you sort of saying to me? Yeah, I'll foreshadow option two if the feral goes down. Yeah. Okay. 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 But we'll have nothing left. Okay. Okay. Definitely, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I, I'm, I'm not particularly um, wedded to a deferral. I just thought I was capturing the mood of the room. I'm, I'm also content, I think, with the recommendation of the uh, um, well, yeah, experts. I think that's where I'm likely to land. But let's let's see how we go. Thunder. Okay. All those in favour of the deferral. Oh, you've got a <laughs> okay, so carried. Okay. Now comes the motion. Uh, in fact, we now put the stand. So much work. All those in favour of the substantive. All those in favour of the substantive. Yeah, no. All those in favour of substantive, this is just a procedural thing. Well, you can vote against it. <laughs> and all those opposed? That's carried. Thank you. Did you guys vote? Yeah. Um, item nine. Um, I've just got some questions, so perhaps somebody else could move on. Happy to move it. Councillor yeah. Abia, yeah. seconded by Councillor Milani. Councillor Abia. Happy to reserve my right. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Hendo wanted to ask some questions. Just trying to yeah, right. second it. Deputy Lord Mayor. Sorry, now I've had I've just got some concerns about, me. about um, the, the, what we're signing up for. I mean, I know we're just signing up to do a plan, but um, it's really taking us down a path where we're going to spend a lot of money on um, that. Uh, that um, what's it called? The, uh, the horticultural hub. That's what I'm, um, the words I'm after. Um, and I'm wondering. We, I don't think we presented with the. What's the alternative if we don't uh, um, put everything? Well, a couple of questions. What's the alternative if we don't consolidate everything in the in the hub? And what are the full expenses if we do? Um, I'm including the other buildings that will have to be repurposed. So, through the chair. 
Um, the purpose of having the Consolidated Hub came out of a plan that was about 10 years ago and originally uh, Hubs 5 was identified for Park 12 and it was only just recently that we identified that we could probably reconsolidate it with the nursery so therefore could negate the need to build another hub in Park 12 and to uh, reconsolidate in, part, in, in the nursery in Park 10. Sorry, get my marks right now. Um, there are some costs associated with repurposing. Uh, one in particular, because it's a heritage listed building, we uh, have the opportunity to reuse that, either to lease it out to a third party, but there would be no ability to demolish that. One of the other buildings, or the storage, is actually currently within a public toilet facility, and so there would be no purpose of knocking that building over, but it would mean that we could redesign that public toilet and actually improve the amenity of that one. Uh, that's on Victoria Drive. Two others could also be um, repurposed as public toilets within an area that has actually uh, required additional public toilets in those areas. So it would be actually cheaper to reconfigure those as public toilets rather than doing it from scratch. And the fifth one is actually part of an existing boat shed, which is leased to a community facility. So we would be able to. Oh, Councillor Moran, I need you to call it. So the alternative, if we didn't consolidate this hub within um, within the nursery, would be that we would go back to the original plan, which would be to build a new hub within Part 12, and get rid of the other five items, uh, five locations. Ah, so so you're saying those other five were going to go and be repurposed in any event? So that's yes. not additional money. No. So okay. the so the original um, the original plan was to move out of a multitude of small uh, small sheds and um, and public or semi public toilets and kitchen facilities yep. and incorporate them into into centralised hubs. Okay, so can I just interrupt you because my question that that is really helpful. And then my other question then I suppose is, do we have an estimated cost if we'd had to purpose build that hub? And through the chair, there was a plan to co-locate it with the University of uh, Adelaide at one stage, and it was, uh, I think it was around 600 at that stage to do that. But the main reason for not pursuing that option was also the, just the operational effectiveness of actually co-locating it with the, with the nursery, where the, the teams actually have to go on a daily basis to either pick up supplies or to drop off green waste. So we're also just looking at the operational effectiveness as well as just the cost to build that. Thank you. I think you've satisfied me. Okay. Do we have any other speakers on this item? Councillor Moran. Um, look, we did discuss this in APLA and it wasn't a clear cut decision because in 2006 the council um, adopted in its community and land management plan that the long term would be recommended to remove the nursery and return the area to park lands. And we're just going to forget about that. I mean, and just I mean, this means it's there forever. So I think the council, before we do anything, has to decide whether we, 10 years later, our long term plan is to remove the nursery and return the area to park lands. Before we start any of this, we need to get rid of that statement or endorse it and have, have another plan. I'm not endorsing this consolidation of this use that the residents of North Adelaide and area really do not like. It smells awful. Um, it's a commercial business. I remember during Michael Harbison's um, term, he was particularly critical of us running a commercial building, a, a business on the park lands, and hence it says that the commercial activity should not exceed current levels. And this is in 2006. I believe it probably does exceed those those levels in 2006, but I don't know. Um, but I, I can't proceed with this until this council discusses whether we want these users in this park. Well, they weren't here, so. uh, through the chair, um, yeah, the purpose of this report um, after its most recent deferral was to bring back uh, a review on the operations of the nursery uh, from that location, which is attachment C to this report, uh, which gives you a, a review that was done internally about the operations, what activities are incurred there, uh, what the costs of those operations are, and what the revenue that's gained from the nursery and waste operations. Um, so we wanted to provide you with further information about the business that's operating from there and the benefits that the council derives from having that location um, with the business there. 
Um, so that, that is the purpose of bringing that back. And also paragraph uh, 22 of the report talks to the revised community land management plan, uh, which uh, is to manage the council nursery effectively and review the ongoing benefit that the council derives from that. So that was the revised position in 2013. And what we hoped was this report would actually give us that opportunity to review the operations, uh, make a determination as to whether we want the business to continue from that location, uh, and if we uh, declare that that was the, the way forward to continue from that location, then we can then confidently proceed with the upgrade to the facility and the incorporation of five hubs into one. Well, so what, what you're saying is that um, if we go ahead, if we endorse this, then we have basically removed our long-term aim to get rid of the nursery from that area. Through you, Chair, I guess given the, the amount of investment yeah. that's required over the next couple of years to incorporate the hubs to this location and also deal with stormwater issues under an EPA requirement, um, that investment would need to be there for the longer term. So, yeah, this, this is a critical uh, decision before we invest. Uh, yeah, I, I can't vote for that at this time. Just a question of administration from the Chair. Um, what, um, what investigations have we looked at in terms of alternate locations um, for the horticultural hub other than this location? Through you, presiding member, we've looked at a number of options. Firstly, uh, we, we've looked at externalising the operations. So we looked at main providers who actually offer green waste services. That's both in regards to processing and also in regards to supply. Um, we're also looking for sites which are suitable. You, you have to note that the EPA license that we're currently under is non-transferable. So if we were to actually to, to look to provide nursery services, or dare I say green waste services, because it's not just a nursery, uh, what would happen is that license wouldn't apply, we'd actually have to apply for a new license. Um, also, there was another question in regards to complaints, um, and I've got the details in front of me. Um, prior to 2011, in relation to odour, we had 12 complaints from two members of the public. 11 of them were, was from one resident in McKinley Parade, and that's when we ceased uh, our composting operations, which is listed within the report. Since uh, 2011, we've received two complaints from one resident, different resident, same house, the house was sold on. Um, so we've in total we've received uh, 14 complaints in regards to odour. We actually reviewed them as well, noting that uh, on the days in question, uh, the wind direction actually didn't uh, correlate in regards to odour. And also we do have a zoo in close location which actually generates more odour than what the nursery does. Well actually, can I just answer that? The reason that people don't complain is because they know there's nothing particularly you can do but I've driven my children down that road every morning for 15 years on the way to school and it is nauseating. It is the, it permeates everything. It's the most revolting smell. First when you smell it, you think, ooh, pretty eucalyptus. But after a while, it, it, it really an upsetting smell. So I think really while we haven't had many complaints, that person we've probably sold his house but maybe left 11 complaints. I think they just people just realise that while the nursery's there, that smell is going to come on a regular basis. And there's very little point bringing uh, anybody to say it stinks, <laughs> you know, because it's mulching up. And uh, I think it's the um, mould in the mulch that sets up a particularly sweet, horrible smell. Through you, presiding member, uh, the councillor is indeed correct, and that, that in particular it's from the anaerobic smells caused by composting. That's why we removed the composting process from the building or the business in 2011. Mm -hmm. So we actually buy that in bagged. So we actually only do mulching, which is a, a either a fine grain mulch or a heavy grain, which doesn't include the same sort of odour. It does make sense. You haven't, you haven't driven your kids to school for a long time. Right. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Claire Hannah. I'm not happy that it stopped. Yeah. Look, I'm in a real dilemma with this because on the one on on the one hand, I understand how the value of consolidation. On the other hand, this is one of the prime locations in the parkland. You have a look at where it's located and its proximity to the river. The river actually wraps around this particular location. And 
I think on the one hand, I can understand why it would be the perfect place because we're already established there. But it was over the years I've been on council, there's always been this push that no, they've not become larger um, and more permanent, that it actually be minimised. Um, and now we're going against that. And I just think that in the longer term, what do we want for that location, for that piece that is very accessible to the river? What, what is the long-term view of ACLA in terms of that, that location and that proximity and access to the river? And here we are, we're really cementing things in for the much longer term. And, uh, and I don't think we've resolved it very well tonight. A motion on the floor. Do we have any return of motion before I put that motion? Okay. Councillor Abia to sum up. Okay, all those in favour of the motion as put. All those opposed? Division. Oh. <laughs> All those in favour of the recommendation to consolidate? Four. All those opposed? That's lost. That's lost. Okay. So I'm not turn I move that we defer to ACLA discuss alternative long term positions. Motion from Councillor Moran to defer to ACLA to consider alternate Consider alternate positions and locations. Locations. Ask up that kind of what different. Just to put you you remember um, Hassan, Atla was confused because they didn't have the information about the long term desire. And it, it is a vexed one because the, the desire to hub things is, is a good thing. And I'm not sure that we won't necessarily come up with this being, but as Sue said, this is a prime river location. We've got plenty of non-prime locations around North Adelaide. We still want to keep it in North Adelaide. We can put it against the ring road in some of the dry areas that are, that are not used. Um, do, do we have a seconder um, for that deferral motion? Anyone can second it. Oh, Seconded by Councillor Anti. Um, um, Councillor Ant has to change his speak. I don't know what I could possibly add to you. Um, so He's on that plan, um, got plenty of chance. So I'll have my chance. And it's happy for me to put that motion to deferral. Yeah. That the matter be deferred to APLA to comment in relation to alternate locations and long term strategy. All those in favour? All those in favour? Can we just get some administrative comment about the deferral? Oh. Is there any problem with it? Okay, we'll have some comment from Tom Creed. Through you, Presiding Member, I think uh, through you, Member's deferral is probably a reasonable response. I think what we'll do is we'll take the uh, report away, look for other suitable locations uh, within the confines of either within the, the boundaries of ACC or even looking external to the boundaries. I think one of the most important things is not only to look at other sites, is are you in agreement in regards to the services that are provided because it actually does service the 776 hectares streetscapes and the squares, if there's an acceptance of the services, then what you're doing is looking at locations. Yeah. 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 Motion. All those opposed? That's carried. Thank you, members. Mm -hmm. <coughs>
Item 11. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> have we moved this printed? I've already pulled it out. Okay. No, that's not. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. yeah. It's been pulled out by Councillor Yes. I would, actually, I, I'd, I'd like to speak against it, but I'd like uh, to propose an amendment. I could, but I, I propose the amendment. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so move the motion. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll someone else propose the motion is printed. Councillor Romani. Seconded. Grab a second. Councillor Deputy Lord Mayor Hendo. Councillor Milani. Serve your right. Deputy Lord Mayor. Reserve your right. Councillor Andy, back to you. Thank you. Well, I'd like to move a motion that the uh, Infrastructure and Public Space Committee recommend the Council that Council um, re uh, review the concept plan for the Colonel Light Centre Entry Plaza for, fur for further more cost effective design. Seconded by Councillor Moran. That's an amendment, that's the opposite. Hmm. No. So, no, just <clears throat> right. so I have second that. Yeah. Yes, second the Councillor Moran, please. All right, well, hey, look, this, uh, I mean, I, I'm surprised this hasn't caused a little more consternation. This, this is essentially a um, uh, concept plan for a very small area of the front of our administrative building and essentially what we're looking to do is pull up some pavers, move a bit of furniture, plant some grass on the uh, on the pillars outside and um, uh, and redo our sign and I, I mean I draw members attention to uh, page 116 of the materials where it refers to the budget allocation. The, the entire costing associated with this is in the order of $425,000. Um, we just spent um, the better part of half an hour, 45 minutes, debating $328,000 to perform the very worthwhile task of um, reviewing our town hall uh, civic area. I mean, I, I just, I'm staggered by the amount of money we're preparing to spend on growing some grass up a wall. Um, I mean, that may well, be, I may have missed the point on, on why that's so meritorious, but at the end of the day, what we seem to come up with in our report is that it's good for air quality. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't mean to be flippant because, of course, some of that is planting trees as well and providing some infrastructure. But at the end of the day, um, we've got ratepayers that are genuinely struggling. We've got a $425,000 proposal on this, which would be something like 400 residential homes or thereabouts to spend money on what is a very simple fit out. I, I just can't understand the costing of this. We've got effectively seven pillars out there. The seven pillars of wisdom will turn very quickly into the seven pillars of wasteum. Uh, if we continue to uh, to go down this path, so I, I, look, I, I I completely understand it's a it's a it's a tired front area, but surely we can find a more cost effective way of tending to this than than four hundred and twenty five thousand um, dollars. I mean, I just can't I just can't believe we could endorse that. Um, so I'd urge members to support the variation. Councillor Moran in seconding that. I'll reserve my right. Is there, right. Any other speakers? Oh, no. I, um, I don't disagree. I, I, I um, moved this because I think it's a, it's a good project. I think it's going to add a lot of value to that space. Um, but can I just get clarity with this amended motion? I mean, I'd like to see it, it's not just grass up a wall, it's, there's some infrastructural change in here. Um, but I'm open to looking at more cost-effective ways to get an out same outcome, the visual outcome. Um, so just with this amended motion, can I just get clarity that um, the intent would be to bring this back with a few different options and maybe look at ways we can squeeze a bit here, squeeze a bit there and still get the desired visual outcome that we're looking to achieve? Uh, administration. Uh, through the chair, uh, that's right. I think we could uh, value engineer the project to look at an uh, opportunity for creating some efficiencies uh, with that. Just noting that uh, this, the options that have been chosen around the Green Wall is a, is a demonstrator for other, for other developers and other, other buildings to take on board. So it's, it is a little bit of a learning, learning curve for Council and the City, I guess, in creating vertical Green Walls. And we've got to acknowledge that uh, what we want to put in place has minimum maintenance requirements on the owning as well. So it's not just our front capital cost. But we're looking at the whole of life costs in regards to this treatment. So, try and get those maintenance costs down over the longer term. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Well, no, that was the point that I was going to make. I'm also happy to, to um, uh, for this matter to be 
to, to, to see if we can do it in a more cost effective way. But it is a demonstration project. It is about us trying to find a way of, of showing people that they can green their buildings. But that, again, is a good reason, I think, to see if we can do it in a more cost effective way. Because if, if the only way you can do it is to spend a zillion dollars, then we're not going to be able to talk anybody into it. There was one other additional factor I'd like uh, just to um, pass on and ask administration to take into account. In having a look at the um, project design, I think one of our other goals is, given that that has a lot of perfect there, is that we use the space to communicate to our public about things that we are doing and things that the uh, that are uh, and events and things that are happening in the city. And I would really like that concept plan to include uh, uh, that communication aspect. It, to me, it's a golden opportunity for us to be um, alerting the passers by to uh, to our own initiatives and to events and activities in the city. Um, and uh, I, I don't know quite how that can be designed in, but some simple and effective way of doing that would, I think, make good use of that space in addition to the greening. Just a comment to take on board and consider. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Bashaw, then Councillor. Um, I, I actually, yeah. when I read this, I saw this as um, administration trying to integrate three separate projects. So they're trying to do the green wall as a demonstration project um, for our um, city greening project. They're trying to do a commemorative artwork, which comes from public art, and they're trying to do a paving for an area that has uh, uh, in excess of 9,000 people that walk through it every day. So, And in lumping it together, it seems like an extraordinary amount of money, but I actually think what they've tried to do is present it as one program. We keep asking them to integrate the various projects across council and what they've done is they've taken greening, they've taken paving and they've taken an artwork and they've put it together. If you also look at the, draw attention to the lifespan of these projects, you've got 30 years for the paving, 20 years for the green wall and 50 years for the artwork. I actually think that they're trying to make best use of the project monies, which come from different pockets, to put it together to make one sort of demonstration, which I, I would support. Councillor Look, it's, some, it's um, uh, it, I actually wanted to bring the same point that Councillor Virtual was talking about in relation to the three separate projects and pockets. I think the reality that we need to meet here, we keep asking administration to deliver on green projects, to deliver on green walls, to deliver on better, to deliver on those infrastructure projects. What we need to accept very quickly is that stuff costs money. I mean, we're asking administration to take this back and deliver a more cost-effective option. If there was one, I'm certain they would have done one. And I think what Councillor Antic is after is a cheaper option that maybe we may want or may not want. I think it's just very important to understand that all the language that's been taking place in the last few days, especially around greening of walls and roofs and all the things that matter for greening, it cost money. And this is what it costs. And we are talking 150000 200000 This is what it costs. That's the reality of it. With that in mind, I don't support, um, I do support Councillor Antic's uh, approach because I do believe it is too costly. So we need to make a decision. Look, I think it's all wonderful to be able to have those solutions, but in reality, to ask administration or to give them to some degree a slap on the wrist and say, take this back, give me a more affordable option. I don't think there is a more affordable option. And the reality is this is what it costs to get these projects done and on the way. So look, I think one of the things we need to understand very quickly, either we have the appetite to spend the money to deliver on this, or we don't have the appetite to spend the money to deliver on this. I mean, there is no other option really. And the reason I don't support this expenditure is I find it quite difficult at this stage to go out to our ratepayers and explain that we're spending money on our own buildings and our own footpath uh, for $425,000 worth um, without having to look at other parts of the city that we need to attend to as well. So it's a bit of a challenge for me to say, well, I'm going to fix my own home and uh, we'll get to yours. Um, and look, it's just, it's a bit of a challenge at this time to, to be able to do that. So look, I, I support the concept. I acknowledge that it's very expensive to deliver on these projects. I think it's important we try to find ways on how to budget for it and how to deliver it because obviously there is, there is a political intent and there's also an administrative intent to deliver on those projects. But we also need to accept the reality that those projects cost money. So either we're going to deliver them or not deliver them. Um, yeah, there's nothing else left for us to do, I think, besides that. Councillor Moran, seconding his last speech. Yes, well, look, I basically agree with uh, Councillor Abiad that um, we are um, 
spending, you know, pointing out we are spending other people's money. $425,000 is an enormous amount of money. I think when we were going through the budget, if we raised it by CP, the rates by CPI, we would get, get be getting less than that. Um, and I'm pretty sure that the air quality um, increase in this small amount of greenery, if we spent it on putting trees in the southwest corner where they've really been asking us for a long time to green their streets, and we really have made pro pro progress for sure, but if we spent a half a million dollars in the southwest corner planting street trees, I think we would improve their quality of life and the air quality in that sector that much needs it, much more than prettying up the front of our building. And that's where I think Hassan makes a good point that we are lavishing half a million dollars on fairly unnecessary things. The paving, you know, if we were in Rome, they don't rip it up every 40 years. That paving, we're not throwing through holes in it. That can last another 10 years. Um, I like the green wall effect, um, but I'm, I, I'd certainly support having another look at how we can do it a little bit more um, cost effectively. Because after all, as, as Councillor Abia was saying, we're asking other people to do it and they're not doing it because it's expensive. So it's very important that we learn how to do it as inexpensively. It is a pilot project to show other people how to do green walls. Well, let's show them how they can afford it. Not spend, as soon as they find out that they're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on it, so well, we're just not gonna do it. Um, I don't agree that our costings in, in the council are always cheap or uh, don't have fat in them. I mean, we've spent a million dollars doing a tiny shed on the Torrens. I think we can we can cut something out of this and still get a good result from the front of our building. Uh, we can still have the green wall, we can still have the pillars, um, maybe hold back on the paving. And I take your point, um, Councillor Vershaw, about the public art, but it, it is putting, I think there would be a better position for public art. Is it necessary that we want to put the art in front of our building? Um, it is not a particular, it is, it's a busy spot, but there might be better places to do it. I'm not saying don't spend it, but I think it all shouldn't be spent in this one very small area. Any other speakers? Councillor Clara. Mm -hmm. Yes, I um, I take up Councillor Vershaw's point and think, you know, here is an example of where we have looked at our strategic directives and here is an example of a project that really fits the bill. It has incorporated a number of aspects of our strategic um, priorities. And I, I, I congratulate the staff for doing that. However, um, given the situation at the moment in terms of our priorities with greening, um, I, I do question um, whether we can actually show our members of public how we could do it uh, less expensively. I don't know about the artwork and whether what we'd end up with there. I think if you're going to have good artwork, well, you know, you can't go to Etsy um, with the green walls. Do we want our staff to, to refer to Pint Interest to get some ideas? Uh, we can't be absolute cheapskates, so let's look for a happy medium on this one. Um, members, may I speak from the chair on this one? Um, just some background on this space. I mean, what's been discussed to is about the green aspect, about the art aspect, but there's also about the uh, interpretation, you know, the historical interpretation of our city. And people may look at the city council as being critical that its own office building is set back from the street when the City of Adelaide plan calls the buildings to be set to the street. But um, there's a story to be told. Chair, in all honesty, yeah. this is more relevant to the discussion. This is not relevant. Over dinner. Over dinner, yeah. I was just getting interested. <laughs> not me. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, but I've, I've got to make a move, so it's not relevant. Just talking about the subject. Well, this was originally a setback area for the church, and it actually had a fence to the front, end, and was, uh, there's some opportunity to tell some of that story through the works that we're doing, not just to agree on an Okay, I put. Sum up, please. Thank you. Well, look, it is a thank you. It is a pilot project, um, but of course, it does beg the question as to whether or not this is ever going to be a good way to use the funds. I mean, Councillor Moran said quite clearly, we, we've got residents. I've got residents in the southwest that are crying out for trees. 
that, that's got to be the priority. This is an issue of priority. I mean, uh, the moment when uh, grass going up a pillar is a priority over things mm -hmm. such as planting trees, that's greening in my view. I mean, that's really what we should be doing. We've got tons of capacity for that. Um, I, I really think we have to look at this, by all means, let's use it as a pilot, let's use it as a way to do it, but let's find a cheaper way to do it. Um, and, uh, and and if we can do that, then all of this, but I think this needs to be put somewhere down the tree, so to speak. <laughs> okay, I put the amendment, all those in favour? All those opposed? That's carried. I get to sum up now. I just wanted to make a quick couple of points. Um, I do think there's a general consensus that we support um, the demonstration element of the green, and I think that's an important message to take away. What I think everyone is saying is that um, to bring back options um, for us to consider, there's no harm in doing that. There's no harm in us um, having a second question around the costing of this. That's our job. Um, picking up Phil's point around the, the, the business case and on the maintenance <coughs> costings, I'd like to see that put in the business case and, and really highlight it a bit more to give us that data to show us. And the other thing I just want to um, plant, plant on the table is um, uh, that corridor there that that space leads into is quite confronting at times. It can be, um, it, it, that, that's not necessarily sometimes a... Did you yeah, it's not the nicest of space to, to walk through and there are times when you don't feel safe in that space and I'd hate, I think we're going to have to integrate those spaces if we're putting, if we're doing something in front of our building, it has to carry through. Um, so I just wanted to, to, um, to consider that when, when you come back with the um, review concept. Okay. okay, I put the substantive, all those in favour of the substantive? All those opposed? That's carried. Uh, now, other business? Do we have any other, other business? Uh, in which case, I now close the meeting at 7.50 and advise members that as the um, uh, much mentioned Queen Adelaide room.